Hey guys, Captain Dylan Hubbard here at Hubbard's Marina with another Sunday night episode of our live stream show. Tonight in studio with me is my dad, Captain Mark. What's going on, Dad? Well, just hanging out with you. Just going to check out this badass studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're excited for another episode of the live stream show. Don't forget, guys, while we're waiting to get started here, don't forget to comment where you're watching from. Uh, and uh, if you're watching on YouTube, give that video a thumbs up for us if you don't mind. If you enjoy watching the shows, if you're watching on Facebook, don't forget to like the video. Helps us to spread the word and let everybody know that we're on and uh, getting ready to start the show. Also, guys, if you comment on Facebook, all you have to do is comment one time. That enters you for a chance to win some free fishing trips. If you don't comment one time, you don't have that opportunity to win. You're not eligible to win. So make sure you comment. Tell us where you're watching from, and uh, if you have questions for tonight's show, if you want your questions answered live during the show, you got to text us those questions to that phone number in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, that 727-393-1947 number. That is the phone number you text uh, your questions to if you want to uh, get entered to uh, the cue for getting your answer, your question answered live during the show. Hopefully, everybody's ready for another great episode. We're going to be starting here in uh, probably about five to seven minutes or so once we get everything rolling. Also, please help us to spread the word by telling your friends the live show is getting started and uh, sharing the video to your favorite Facebook group for us. Harold Strickland, thanks, buddy. Appreciate the stars kicking us off tonight. Thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in. Looks like uh, Bennett Gooden, thanks for the stars, buddy. And uh, Justine, what's going on? Thanks for going out in the boat yesterday. Uh, Tracy Jones, good evening. How are you? Joseph from Holy Hill. What's up, man? Thanks for tuning in. Can you read the comments, Dan? That is pretty... I'm, even, I got glasses in that. That's hard for me to read. <laughs> it was, Josh is zipping them up and down. That was pretty good. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there. Now you can read them. All um, right, guys. We <laughs> are just a few moments away from getting started. Just want to make sure our uh, comment giveaway deal is working so we can make sure we don't miss any of those. Dan the Fishman on YouTube. What's up, buddy? Thanks for watching on YouTube. Delta David from Tampa. Thanks for watching. Ricky Iker from Clearwater. Appreciate you guys on YouTube as well. Terry Feather. Thanks for those 100 stars. Tom Ton Tonic. Thanks for your 150 stars. Thank you, guys. Those stars, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're new to watching on Facebook, those stars are just a way to show your support, and uh, it really helps us to do uh, these live shows and uh, helps to fund the studio and uh, uh, our uh, bar cart as well. <laughs> so appreciate you guys for sending stars. Always very, very appreciated of that. Powder Springs, Georgia, ready for some fishing. I would imagine so. It's got to be cold up there. Chad Anger, thanks for those stars, man. It's it's cold up north right now. This last cold front was a bad one for him. That's what they say. Yeah. We wouldn't know. It uh, was I'm, I'm get, getting down here. That prog chart this morning was impressive. Yeah. It looked like a spider over Florida. Oh, really? I took a picture of it, actually. All the, all the prefrontal... Uh, Lines, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I was, uh, it surprised me. Oh, wow. Major occluded front. <laughs> double low, double O's yeah. on the East Coast. And that was a sort of just a cloudy day, but still beats snow. Yeah, yeah. Cloudy and overcast today. Joey Sloan, thanks for those stars, man. Appreciate you. Corey Lane, appreciate you as well. Susan Campbell, thank you very much. 
And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the weather once the show gets started. Brad Wooten, Donald Wilson, thank you guys. So uh, we'll we'll definitely be uh, talking about the weather and. Uh, I should, uh, should I text that to you? Uh, yeah, you can. Um, and we'll be showing you some photos here as soon as we get started. Seventy degrees in Ohio. That's not bad, Randy. I know I was talking to someone who said that they were uh, dealing with some snow still on the ground. That's crazy. Mike Hart, thanks for those 500 stars, buddy. All right, sorry for the momentary pause. We are just about ready to get started. Oh, we started. Look at that. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, y'all. Again, uh, Captain Dylan Hubbard, my father, Captain Mark, and uh, we're looking forward to another great episode of the live stream show. Greg Roberts, what's up, man? Thanks for tuning in, and uh, let's kick this puppy off. We're a little early, but I guess we can get started early. Let's kick this puppy off by looking at those photos. Uh, yeah, the sound went away for a second, Terry. We had to mute it for a quick minute uh, as we discuss some last-minute details. Sherry Griffiths, Griffiths. <laughs> thanks for those stars. Really appreciate it. So uh, let's get started by looking at some of these photos. Uh, here is Estelle with her redfish. I think I forgot to look at the dates on some of these. The, Estelle sent me this one uh, last week during the show, but eh, it is what it is. Are we sure we're on, Yeah, we're on the right day. Redfish are coming in thick. The, those boys there at the dock when we were coming in off the overnighter. Yeah. They were, no, we were going out. That was Tuesday night. Yeah, they Tuesday They were getting double headers. Mm -hmm. Those kids said they caught 42 redfish that day. Wow. On the dock uh, fishing with shrimp. They caught a couple big snook, too. Definitely a lot of redfish around the docks, and the snook are starting to come back for sure. Thanks, Adam Franklin, for those stars, buddy. Uh, so some more redfish from the dock. This was right there on the dock uh, from the catwalk to uh, the main dock and along the beach. Everybody's been catching those redfish for sure. And a lot of them still out on the flats along those mangrove shorelines, the Good bait lately for those redfish has definitely been the live shrimp or the greenbacks, uh, but a lot of people still using those soft plastic paddle tails for sure. All righty. Let's see. The sheep's head bite still going really well. We're seeing a lot of those sheep's head around the docks and bridges. Uh, it's getting to be warmer slowly, uh, so the sheep's head are going to start slowing down eventually. Uh, but right now, they're still biting. All right, let's see what else we got here, Josh. Snook are coming in for sure. Uh, they're starting to move back into the pass and stack up in the mornings around uh, those dock lights and bridge lights. So real, real excited and looking forward to another great snook-filled snook summer. Uh, the trout, speckled trout at night, have been really thick around the Johns Pass Bridge. They're catching the crap out of them on those soft plastic paddle tails. John likes making up those uh, uh, loves lures, essentially. I love those. Those are yeah. my favorite. So you we can't make them ourselves. Yeah, you can't. Two paddle tails. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't buy make, them anymore, but right. he's just making the little dropper rig uh, to uh, get them started. Remember when we were doing those? We did three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Long line and trout. Yeah. <laughs> throw, throw it out there like a sabiki rig, like four paddle tails on it. <laughs> 
We used to do that on the hub after school. We'd go out there like a mile from shore and do the the silver trout. Yeah, up off Reddington. Yeah, those I'll, fish are still there. Yeah, a lot of people don't know they're there, but they're there. Yeah, it's every been winter. Every winter, when when is the silver trout like the thickest? They uh, about the same time as mackerel. So I would imagine this time of year in the spring. Yeah, yeah. right, right now. So yeah, with no clear water, you go up there and. Catch two, three at a time, as many hooks as you got. <laughs> Put it down there. You, mackerel are just starting to come in, and then uh, this front came through. So it, uh, the water temp was getting up to 76, and then I heard it's 72 now. Good. So it mixed it up a little bit. Good. Uh, hopefully that will hold them here a little longer because the mackerel got really thick, and then the kingfish started showing up. Uh, a guy this past week caught a 61-pound kingfish behind the Doncey's Ark. Mm. Like, uh, within two miles from the beach. That's that's yeah. like king of the beach material right there. Yeah, that a, that's a that's a winning fish. <laughs> yeah, sixty-two pound fish. kingfish. That's a monster. But uh, we want to show you some uh, photos from uh, all, near shore and offshore. Now that we've uh, talked a little bit about the inshore stuff, so this photo was sent in to us uh, for the show. Nice big old amberjack caught and released on a private trip. Uh, definitely seeing a lot of those uh, big amberjack from uh, the recreational guys kind of looking for them. Hopefully amberjack will open in May. We'll find out for sure at this next golf council meeting in April. Definitely excited about that. Here's a nice gag grouper from a hub five-hour half day. That's got some beautiful color. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And... Always love the kids out fishing. This was sent to us by one of our guests. The reason I wanted to put it in the show is the one little boy kept calling Captain Frank, Captain Flank. <laughs> so he got off the dock and he's like, I had a great trip, Captain Flank. And oh man, that, that is Captain Frank's new nickname is Captain yeah. Flank. So everybody make sure you use that. <laughs> he's not here to, to defend himself no, either. No. <laughs> Serves him right. <laughs> Nice red grouper. This was from a five-hour half day. We've actually been seeing the red grouper bite pick up a little bit near shore. They caught a nice keeper red grouper on the half day today, along with some nice keeper hogfish. That would be fantastic. I remember that one year we were just demolishing them. Yeah. 60 to 80 foot. The commercial vertical line fishermen were fishing between the party boats. Yeah. Commercially fishing for red grouper. Yeah. That one year. Yeah, it's definitely been uh, uh, a little slow on the red grouper front the last couple of years but they definitely seem to be rebounding pretty well for us so hopefully that'll continue and then we had that cold front move through and it stirred up the water holy moly angelo thank you buddy 1200 nice stars and uh demetrius toller appreciate you as well but uh what i was saying about the cold front is it stirred up those waters uh near shore so we got real kind of muddy colored water and behind those fronts this time of year uh it makes the fishing very unique uh behind the front so that muddy water uh caused yesterday's half day to have a little slow fishing overall uh but they caught some uh unique catches along with the sheep's head you'll see some others but uh Definitely pretty wild. We'll see the, the photos. Fish that there can, it is. Uh, navigate the mud. Yeah. The rest of the fish are coughing sand, and these guys can sniff out the baits. Yeah. That's a beautiful trout. Yeah. Big old trout there, Greg Roberts, and uh, showing off a nest speckled trout. So not only did we catch a sheep's head, a speckled trout, uh, but then we caught another weird one too, which will come up here in the photos. And uh, here's Cam Frank in a Cam Fwink. I'm Captain sorry. Flank. Was that on uh, Thursday? That was on the 10-hour trip on Tuesday, I Tuesday, believe. Tuesday, okay. Yeah, yeah. They definitely uh, had a nice catch of some good hogfish. The hogfish bite seemed to kind of slow down a little bit, and Frank and I were talking. He was saying that they seemed to move off the ledges, uh, and they're kind of more scattered out there in that shell hard bottom area, uh, and they're all rowed up. So we're uh -huh. thinking that they moved off the ledges uh, for spawn, and uh, that's why they're slowed down a little bit for us for the last couple of weeks. But yeah, that one's odd. starting to get them more dialed in. Yeah, the females look look, look a little funky. Thing. Yeah, they got a weirder weird mouth on them for sure. It was funny the uh, news anchor for Fox 13 
uh, Russell was off this past Friday. So I had Laura, the, the lady, the woman uh, anchor, yeah. uh, doing my uh, good catch report with me. And uh, before we started, she was like, you don't have any photos of hogfish in here, do you? And I was like, oh, yeah, I do. And she, <laughs> she apparently doesn't like the way hogfish look. <laughs> it oh, freaks really? her out. So it, she was a little uh, upset that we had a bunch of hogfish photos, but it was it was pretty comical. I was like, you, would, you wouldn't think that uh, they look funny once you eat one. Because, man, do they taste great. They look funny, but they taste great. And here's a scamp grouper from the 10-hour all, uh, hour all day. Been seeing a few of those guys as well. Uh, one of my favorite eating fish, for sure, especially those smaller scamp. Mm, nice porgy. Big old porgy. Definitely the porgies have been pretty active, mixed in with some nice lane snapper. We saw some good lane snapper on the... 10-hour, and uh, on the 5-hour half day today, some big lanes came up, too. So that was pretty cool. Is that all of them? Okay. So let's look at the 39-hour photos real quick and uh, see what we were uh, catching on that 39-hour. This was the 39-hour you ran, right? I Yeah, if it's uh, yeah. from the last one, yeah, I got a chance to run one. Finally. <laughs> Finally. Finally. You guys threatened to put me on a boat last year, and... It never happened, and uh, so finally Garrett was out of town with Pappy and uh, Captain Joe, and yeah, so I got a chance to run one. Yeah, nice vermilion. You it guys was, did uh, pretty well for it was the a weather. Little picky, it was a little picky, but uh, we had some nice fish. Yeah, uh, it was, it's hard to go wrong out there. I remember years and years ago, uh, one of the other captains struggled. And like one barrel of fish. Yeah. And I was like, my gosh, I, that's like so bad. Oh, there's Captain, Captain Les. Yeah. He came out as my guest. He was a dock master at the Yacht Club for 15 years or so. He did. He, he said it was 30, to, 37 30, years. Did he taught you how to sail, right? You and Tara. He and tried. And Corey. <laughs> and the, uh, how to drive a boat and how to sail the uh, prams. Yeah. He tried to teach me how to sail. I kept always uh, talking him out of the power boat, and then I would drive <laughs> around and uh, harass the other sailors. Yep. So that was that was my goal, but yeah, it was he, always fun. He's in his mid seventies, and he's out there. He fished the whole time. He Grind. was at the rail the whole time, and he just kept telling all these stories. Then he'd come up. He helped steer the boat in. Oh, really? Yep. He helped helped out on the way out and the way back, telling all the stories. He got on my computer, and we looked over in the Bahamas of all the places where he grew up over in Luthra. Hmm. That's crazy. He grew up in the Bahamas? Yeah, in the island of Luthra. And then um, he's moved around, hopped around and stuff. But he was, like, telling these stories where they would marlin fish off the shore with kites. What? And they would let the kite take their bait out, and the, it drop off to, like, 100 fathoms, like, a quarter mile out. Hmm. And they'd catch these big marlins and drag them into the beach. What? And yellowfin tuna, marlin, blackfin tuna. From shore? From the beach, from the little cliff. It was like a little 15-foot cliff or something. What? <laughs> this That's little crazy. spot down there where it gets deep quick. That's nuts, man. You just never know. Different areas have such unique fisheries for sure. I was fishing next to her. She was up there on the starboard bow. Christina? Oh, she She's a good with fisherman. with her uh, naked ball jig, knocking out those uh, mangroves and... Porgies and all kinds of stuff. She'd tip it with a little bait and mm -hmm. send it down there. She was hardcore on the naked ball jigs. Yep. I heard Will put on a uh, a clinic at the end of the trip on mangrove snapper. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I was. It was frustrating because it was like we we're right on this peak, and it's like one of my favorite spots. And I I knew the fish were there. I mean, it was a nice show, but they were just acting so weird. And uh, we didn't have any real good mangrove snapper fishermen on board, so he picked up a rod and started and knocked out 11 fish in, like, a half an hour. That's Just crazy. one after another. And yeah. it was like... So he was saying... he was. I was talking to him about that, and he said uh, the bite just got really picky, uh, that the fish... He felt like it, there was a ton of fish down there, but just people were just either missing the bite or uh, had the wrong setup. They so. were using bigger tackle, have bigger baits, mm -hmm. full plug sardines. He went down to just a little piece of a sardine and a single hook, yeah. where everyone's using the double hooks with the, a full plug of a sardine. Yeah. And the fish just weren't that aggressive. Yeah. They were just barely picking it up. This one fish I caught, I didn't even know I had him. I was like, what the heck? It's just feeling really weird. And I reel it up, and there's a 
about a 13, 14 inch mangrove on it. It was like <laughs> weird. Yeah. And these guys, I don't know where they're coming from, but the we got a bunch fish. of bluefish. That's interesting. And Brian got them the last trip too. Yeah, and we didn't get a lot of kings and mackerel. The hmm. blues usually hang out with the kings and mackerel and black fins. Yeah. So it's sort of odd that they're there, but the kings and mackerel are not. Hmm. John Anderson, thanks for those 500 stars, buddy. Justin. Oh. <laughs> Justin Perlow, he's a good angler. Yep. But uh, Will was sent telling me that it was uh, he dropped down to really, really light, light tackle. He was using like 30-pound fluorocarbon and like a four or five-aught hook, a super small hook, super small piece of bait. I, don't think, I think it was like a three or four-aught hook. Yeah. Oh, really? It was, yeah, it was Really small. small. And just a little chunk of sardine. Yeah, just like a little little cube. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Little red snapper action. Didn't get a lot of red snapper, but we weren't really in the red snapper area. You successfully avoided them. I doubt I did. <laughs> we won't be for long, though. It's so funny. All year round, we uh, we try to avoid the red snapper, and then we shift very quickly into focusing on them for a few few uh, weeks, and then go right back to trying to avoid them. <laughs> Definitely a nice little uh, mix of fish, though. It was. We did all right. Uh, probably got. I think 40 red grouper, but not any real big trophies. I was disappointed in that. We were just uh, picking up the uh, the just legal 20-inch fish. I mean, it was just, it was annoying. And we threw back a lot of shorts. Yeah. I don't know if I was fishing behind Captain Brian in areas, uh, but because I hadn't been out there in a while, you know, it takes a, you know, a couple trips to start figuring out where it was. There's a couple of places I wanted to run to. But uh, you just sort of, the way I fish, I just sort of pop around and move slowly into different areas rather than, like, you're picking at fish. I don't want to leave those to go hunt for new fish, but maybe I'll have a better bite when I'm picking at a few here. Yeah. I mean, I could die over there, and then it's just annoying. So I tend not to go for long runs. Yeah. You I know to. they're they got to be thick out there somewhere. We just got to figure out where they are and start moving around. Yeah. Brian's got them dialed in pretty good, and uh, uh, Garrett is running Tuesday. He's uh, he's excited about this Tuesday overnighter coming up. It's got yeah. a super light load on it. I think they have 21 people going yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, 24 on mine. Yeah. I'm going to talk to him about it because I, I, yeah, there's a, there's an area out there. I, I feel they're, they could be there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and it, it's not – far too far away to where where they are where we know they are but um if we could find a new pod of fish another herd that would be that'd be good yeah the spawning aggregate Mm -hmm. (laughs) that one year boy i got them i found them and uh one i think it was a seven or eight hour soak one anchor we had over 800 head of mangroves we got a limit of amberjack and we had a bunch of gags that's crazy. After daybreak, I and mean, we sat there for from two in the morning all the way through daybreak, wow. and just demolished them, filled the boxes practically. <laughs> mangroves, eight hundred fish. That was, a, I mean, filled two boxes full of mangrove stampers. That's crazy. And we, I went back to that area multiple times, and uh, they were just spawning so thick there. Yeah, it was something. They're still there, but they're not like that. Yeah. And they move around the grounds, and they they come in, and they'll they'll get up on a big ledge and do their thing and they'll stay there for three months. Mm-hmm. So we just got to figure out where they are. And it's coming soon. That's that spawn time for those uh, mangrove snappers, not far away for sure. So we're definitely excited about that for sure. And we have super light loads Tuesday and Friday's overnighter only has 32 people on it. So real light loads on both 39 hours this week. We Great were opportunity. with the flat lines a lot this trip. Yeah. Um, we constantly have flat lines out because of the, the kingfish are going to be rolling through. When they roll through, then you get the black fins with them. So this is the time of year where we'll get 20 head of black fins. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's because we have that flexibility, uh, because we have the, the flexibility of having light loads on the boat. So uh, one thing I wanted to show you guys, uh, y'all asked about it, and uh, we finally uh, got it filmed, uh, the, the photo or the video of Captain Flink. we got to change the <laughs> title on that video, by the way, to Captain Flink. 
said, <laughs> but uh, Captain Frank's special line to line knot. We got it filmed. It's up on our fishing tips and tricks page, but we'll play it for you real quick. Uh, the one that uh, Will, is it similar to the one Will does? You'll see. This one's unique for sure. I like what Will puts together. He does it so quick. Yeah, this and one's it holds. Quick. I mean, it holds really yeah, well in really different well, size lines. Size, size. What's, What's this one called? Right. Well, this, this is called the you want to go ahead and mute us, Josh? Sure. We'll, we'll call it that. All right. Let's um, see it. So a lot of you guys were asking about a line, uh, a monofilament to braid um, situation. So this is the easy one that I promise you guys that for the visually impaired that it might help you out here. This is so, called a line-to-line -line knot, how you secure a top shot on top of your braid. We're going to simulate monofilament line in a braid, okay? This is actually going to be the braid over here, okay? So it doesn't really matter, but you're going to be wrapping the braid around the monofilament. So this is how we're going to do it. Two loops, all right? Here's the braid. Place the braid through the first loop. Super easy. Wrap this around. Wrap that loop of braid around your monofilament line. And you're going to want to do that about six times. Okay. You can do it up to 80. Then put the, take the end of that loop of braid, put it through your original loop of the monofilament, and pull it tight. That's it. That's it. Cut those, those tags off. So and you've got a couple different tags here. You've got the, the you loop of braid. Off. The loop of braid sticking out, and then you got the two tags of the braid and mono hanging down. That's it. So you double up the mono, double up the braid, you stick the loop of braid that you created through the loop of mono. That's right. We'll do you one want to show it again? We'll do one more time since we got we got a, a spare ends here. All right. Two loops, braided line, through the monofilament loop. Wrap that around there. You're, so that you you're going to do this about eight times. I'm old, six to eight times. I only do three on this this rope here. Bring it right back through that original monofilament hole and tighten her up. That's it. Easy peasy. All right, man. And uh, that's do the that in the dark. special. All right, man. Thank you, Frank. All right. So that was it. That, that was, was the that Captain was the Frank Captain special line-to-line line line knot that you guys had asked about, and uh, we wanted to get filmed. We're still working on getting uh, the grouper cutting video filmed, um, but we'll do that Thursday morning, hopefully, with Will. Uh, uh, Will uh, got done with the fish cleaning this past Thursday a little too fast, unfortunately. Michael Jimmy, what's going on, Jimmy family? Here Thanks. they are. 1500 stars appreciate Damn. you guys um so we will definitely get that grouper cutting video so they the uh request was they wanted a video on how to clean a grouper but most specifically how to get the cheeks out of a grouper and uh how to save the throat i'd love to do that so, yeah so we need to do a, a we need to get one of those bigger grouper to do that with for sure so Excited like about uh, it. One technique that I do, Tim Nachman showed me, mm -hmm. where you get the entire throat mm -hmm. of the grouper and then mang or, uh, red snapper and mangrove snapper. You don't do it that way. You just cut through the, the gill plate mm -hmm. and uh, take just the uh, meaty part of the throat. Mm -hmm. But um, even just butterflying a mangrove snapper, scaling and butterflying, and then you you stuff them with crab meat, you know, like Will was doing the whole fish. Yeah. But you can butterfly them and do the same thing. That's, that's cool. Grandpa used to do that all the time. Yeah, like uh, you're talking about butterflying, like how you would order smoked mullet at Ted Similar, Peters. similar. Mm -hmm. Where a smoked mullet, you're leaving the backbone on one side, mm -hmm. but uh, butterflying a fish, you don't, you take the entire backbone and the head off, and the rib cage is intact. I got you. And uh, you just lay it down flat on the on the thing. Hmm. With the skin still on. S yeah, skin scale. still on. Got to scale them. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that skin keeps the fish real moist. Yeah. And Mango the snapper is a little oilier fish, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it has a lot of taste. It has a lot of body. Yeah. What's your favorite way to prepare your fish? Uh, whole, filleted? Filleted with the skin, not grouper, but mangrove snapper or red snapper, you scale. Mullet, you scale. Uh, even sheep's head, you scale. Um, you skin snook and redfish um and then you smather it with uh, hellman's mayonnaise 
and cook it on broil up high, like right up. You put your thing as high up as you can in your broiler and put it 500 degrees and cook it. If it's a thin piece of meat, you don't have to turn it over. Just leave it on one side. Grandma would cook all all the mayonnaise cooks off and has a nice black crust on it. If you're grilling it, you do the same thing. You do both sides, but you got to flip it. So you do it on one side and let it sear really quick and then flip it. Because if you let it cook too much and you try to flip it, the fish falls apart. Yeah. So you flip it before it gets cooked all the way through, and that works well. But, again, similar to a steak, you know, that, that 1,000, 1,100 to 1,200 degree uh, hot heat. Yeah. If you Tricky. have a thicker piece of meat, you got to cut it down a little bit. Yeah, got to keep it thin. Yeah. And we have the uh, video there. Josh has uh, got it pulled up there on how to cook your catch. That's the recipe uh, with the Hellman's mayo. It's got to be Hellman's mayo. Yep. Got to be Hellman's mayo. Very, very not specifically. The, the, not the light, not the, not the oil one, but yeah. just a regular Hellman's mayonnaise. Yeah. Don't, don't get any other kind of mayo. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, do our first trip. It is time to give away a five-hour half day for two guests. Let's see who the lucky winner of our five-hour half day trip is. We don't have the drum roll yet, do we? Not yet. Ray Johnson. Ray Johnson, you are the lucky winner of that five-hour half day for two guests. Rick Hill, no. Hellman's Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> So, Ray Johnson from North Texas, make sure to claim your free trip. In order to claim your free trip, you got to text us that phone number over there. <laughs> or now it's over here. Text that, fo- uh, that, home num- or that phone number, your home address, to claim your free trip and to prove that you are watching live. All right, let's get into some questions, Josh. How big would a red grouper have to be to consider it a trophy? Uh, I mean, to me, that would be probably a 12 to 15 pound red grouper, something in the 30 pound or 20 pound if, range. If you never catch red grouper, a keeper, a 22 one. inch grouper is a trophy. Yeah, you're right. But if you're fishing a lot and you're an advanced angler, mm-hmm. then 25 pounder is going to be that trophy. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we fish deeper for them and we get in those potholes, usually you got one big trophy in there and then you get two three maybe five or six uh 15 pounders then you get a couple uh 24 inch ones you know in the party boat when we're fishing the, the potholes you know we'll, we might pull 10 grouper off it or 15 grouper off it, it would be really nice mm-hmm. and uh on the flying hub too that they do a lot of that kind of fishing yeah. And you catch the, the real big one, and it's like a hierarchy on yeah. the pothole. And, um, yeah, the, the trophies are, those are big fish. Yeah. yeah it's a, but then again, you know, if someone doesn't catch them very often, and uh, a 22-inch <laughs> Craig Grouper is a trophy. I mean, you get these bass are 12, or, I mean, up in Floral City Lake, our grove up there, nine, eight to nine-pound bass are that, those are beautiful it. fish. and uh, But you go over Lake Panasofsky, and a 14-pound bass That's is awesome. normal. Yeah. So it's something. Changes. It changes. Changes based on context, I guess. Yep. On your Saltiga reels, do you use braided line? So I have braided line on my reel just for uh, line capacity and also, it gives you a little bit more sensitivity when uh, fishing in deeper water. Uh, but you definitely don't need braided line. The salty guy I got you for Christmas, you put mono on it. I have straight, uh, I think I have 60-pound Berkeley Prospect. Prospect. Prospect, which is it's about the diameter of 50. Yeah. And, uh, but it's a it's, it's, it's good line. I do have a backing of braid if I got a pelagic on there and he dumped a spool. But, uh, yeah, no, it's on a soft rod. It's on a, a, a Harrington rod, so it's sort of silly for me to put braid on that rod because it's such a soft rod. Yeah, I mean, that's just dialed in for mangrove snapper and an occasional uh, grouper, which this, this trip was perfect for because 
we weren't getting in a giant grouper and we weren't um uh, we we're mainly focusing on mangroves so that was that was a perfect setup mm -hmm. the uh, i did bring my other rod i was going to offer it to les but he so enjoyed the rods he brought so i never even gave it to him which was the old school newell with the uh, straight i think that's i think i had 50 on it with 40 liters i was using 40 liters the whole time mm-hmm the Newell, the Harrington, most of the tackle that you fish with, uh, people would be uh, having on their wall or, yeah. or uh, oh my retired. <laughs> on the ceiling of the marina, I was pointing out to Captain Chris. I said, I think that's Ken Rector's rod. Yeah. Ken Rector used to run the marina years ago, and he moved to Texas, and he's yet he's now passed away. But uh, it's either his or it's Santa's it's rod, Santa's. who also yeah. is gone. So it's... Uh, um, it's the old ugly stick, tiger stick. Yeah, that was with, a classic. With uh, the high speed pin. Mm -hmm. Three, I think it was a, th is that a three out that's on that thing? I think it's a three out. I'm not if sure. But it's a high speed aluminum spool. Yeah. And that was the, that was the shiznit back yeah, then. It was. And we must have sold thousands of those yeah. tiger sticks. And those reels too. Everybody had tiger sticks when they first came out. Those uh, tiger sticks for sure were ugly, a popular ugly. rod. Yep. But uh, that one specifically is Santa's, and uh, he had left it there because he was getting uh, rides down to the marina and didn't have a way to transfer his rod with him, so we let him store it at the marina. I think I might have to put that on my wall. And then when he passed, label it. When he passed I uh, put it up in that rod rack. Got to put a label. We had to have a label on it. Yeah. With a picture. I had a, a tag on it, and it fell off, and I just haven't gotten around to replacing it. But, yeah, we should definitely put it, uh, put another label back on it. Santa Claus. All right, next question. What do we got? What size rod and reel would be good to catch red grouper? And what size braid? Um, so typically for us, most of the time for red groupers, kind of kind of be something that you're targeting along with mangrove snappers. Yeah, the stuff. reds don't get into the rocks, so mm -hmm. you don't have to go crazy. I mean, you just do 60-60 mm -hmm. for red grouper, and you can catch a 20-pound red grouper. Yeah. Uh, if you're fishing Swiss cheese, that might be a little different if you know the bottom you're fishing. Yeah. But a basic pothole, 60-60, you land a 20-pound red grouper. It's uh, A lot of times you're drifting, and a lot of times you've got a little bit longer leader, and you can get them off the bottom before they can get down into it. They, when you're fishing for gags, that's a, just a whole different thing. Yeah. And uh, but for red grouper, the uh, slow drift summertime through potholes and bait piles, it's just flat hard bottom. If there's a big huge bait pile, um, it's hard for us to do that with the Florida. I'd get a little uppity every now and then, mm -hmm. and uh, I would actually go off the grounds onto the hard bottom. And if it's a light load, get everyone on one side of the boat. Remember that charter we took down in Jupiter? Yep. And, and that we drifted for uh, mutton. mutton snapper. Mm -hmm. That technique, I used that on the middle grounds or mm -hmm. off the middle grounds. I got everyone on one side of the boat and went to 10-foot leaders. It was really hard to get the regulars to do it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it worked. I mean, we just drifted through that area, and we were just picking up those big red grouper. And it, it, was, it worked well. Yeah. It's Different. definitely uh, drift fishing on those longer trips is not popular with the uh, captains. Brian, Garrett, Joe, none of those guys like to drift fish too much. No, and then the, the it's hard if you have people on both well. sides of the boat. Yeah, you got to get everyone on one side, mm -hmm. and we assign spots, so it's hard to get anyone to leave their spot and all their gear and all their stuff. Yeah, but on a light load, yeah, again it. When you're real motivated, I, I physically picked up their crap and moved it to the other side of the boat. So you're fishing over here. And uh, and it worked because we would catch fish, and they caught fish. Now, if I choked and we didn't catch fish, then I would have been the enemy. But no, no, it worked. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on using fluorocarbon? So I personally like using fluorocarbon just because uh, – I think it makes a little bit For of a leaders. difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, it works great. But they do a lot of testing now. Like the guys at Salt Strong did a huge thing about fluorocarbon versus monofilament for leaders. And they did underwater videos and tests and all this stuff. And they virtually said it's the same. 
Like, but the difference between fluorocarbon and monofilament is so small. Well, certain kinds of monofilament. I like use uh, the old triple fish monofilament, mm -hmm. super soft. Yeah. And it would cut. And yeah. there's the Berkeley pr Prospect. Prospect. Whatever, prospect. Yeah. It, that is a really hard. I would say that's similar chemical uh, makeup of the fluorocarbon because yeah. it is such a hard line and it's it has such a higher strength breaking strength I, you know it's so the andy i mean that that was good line but they, you know, different you have different lines yeah yeah they're all different so the difference the main difference between fluorocarbon and monofilament is fluorocarbon has uh, more abrasion resistance. Yeah, so it's harder as, line. It's harder. Yeah. So as far as the difference between the two, as far as like disappearing in the water and such, that's what I was saying. They're about the same. But as far as uh, abrasion resistance goes, fluorocarbon is definitely superior to yeah. monofilament. I'm use thirty pound mono to catch mangroves. It's probably going to pop, and you're going to have to switch it every other fish. Mm -hmm. Where fluorocarbon, is you might be able to. Get a couple more fish in before, and you won't. It won't. You won't pop. It won't. Mm -hmm. You won't. You won't. The, the tooth of the fish won't cut it. And the Berkeley Pro Spec is my new favorite monofilament yeah. too. Richie Sipple, thank you. Yeah, I use it a lot, and uh, I found it at Bass Pro. And the guy who uh, manufactures all the rods for Bass Pro and is in charge of product development. Um, Terry is his name. He tournament fishes for Marlin, and they uh, were testing that line before it was even labeled and branded. And he had a huge Marlin on the line somewhere down in, like, I, I forget where he said it was, in the Caribbean somewhere. And uh, he had a huge Marlin on. It had dumped the spool. Like, it was way, way, way away from the boat. And a freaking tanker came by and ran over the line. Oh, my God. Tanker, huge 1,500-foot tanker, runs over the line, goes all the way past it, and uh, they put out. it in, in uh, free spool and just let the fish run. And uh, the tanker passed, and the fish was still on the line. They ended up oh landing it. Gosh. Yeah. Dan Coover is telling me his neighbor has been trying to hunt for one. He's had uh, three marlins on, and all every time everyone's broke the line. Wow. It's like... I hope you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need to switch out all your line. <laughs> yeah, prospect. Yeah, it's it's definitely incredible, the difference for sure. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, so, most common rookie mistakes. What's the most common rookie mistakes on a 39-hour trip? Just back flashes, I think. Backlashes, backlashes, and jerking. Yeah, you don't know? be a jerk. Real. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the two two biggest mistakes. I mean, a backlash is a backlash. People, you know, they're watching me, and I, I'll throw it out fifty yards out, and then they try to take their rod and do it. And it's just the biggest thing with that is you you cast out, you stop the lead before it hits the water. Mm -hmm. If if you don't stop your spool. When that hit lead hits the water, the spool keeps spinning. It's just go. Bleep, you got your backlash, and mm -hmm. if you got braid. Oh, you're in a pickle. <laughs> just throw it in the water. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the other thing would be you get a little bite and you jerk and don't reel. Yeah, and I saw it all this whole trip. I mean, it's just over and over and over again. It's just you got to reel first, to get all the tension out, and then lift your rod tip up. Those are the two biggest silly things people do and then what about uh like packing wise like what are what are your some suggestions that you would give a first just pack time like just pack light yeah i mean it's uh now on the, on that note this guy packs the lightest i've ever seen <laughs> anybody i mean literally brings a very small duffel bag and a couple rods and a pillow it's There's, so funny that bag, that's the same bag I've used since so before three I was years, born. Four years ago. <laughs> yeah. And so I take it up to the grove, I take it back, I carry it all around, and it's, I don't even open it. Yeah. It's like, I, but I got everything in there. It's, you know, I got my, my gun, I got all my medications. I don't take medication, but all like ibuprofen, this, that, yeah, the other your thing. vitamins. It's toothbrush, this, that. It's just all the stuff. It's like, but yeah, it's just you get used to carrying it, and that's what I do. And, uh, Yep, like the duffel bag and then the computer and all the numbers. Yep. Yeah, super, super. Uh, and a tackle box. 
Yeah. <laughs> a, and a small tackle box at that. Uh, what about weights? Good recommendation on... Oh, before we get off that subject, on a 39-hour trip, what you definitely don't want to forget that a lot of people do is uh, D-hookers, line cutters, and then bait cutters. So some good bait shears, uh, a little bait net, uh, or you could get all that stuff at the office before you leave. Six-pack cooler. To put your bait in. I noticed a lot of people didn't have that this trip. I had to go hunting around because... uh, I don't. I didn't bring one. Because we keep them under the stairs. I, that's where I got one. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody told me a clue, so yeah. uh, we got that and uh, we uh, had it filled it up. And Captain Les and I used it the entire trip. One cooler. It was like two thirds full. The entire trip, both of us used that cooler of, of the fish, and uh, it it was it was good. It worked yeah. the whole time. Whereas if you don't have one. Then you're constantly having to go get bait and cut, and you put it in buckets, and it gets soft and mushy. Uh, you want to be able to have a little six-pack cooler. And brine your bait. A little bit of salt. If you can't get rock salt, then just regular table salt. Get one of the little containers. You just layer bait, a little bit of salt, layer bait, a little bit of salt. So rock salt would be your suggestion? There's always a great yeah. debate. Oh, yeah, over rock the- salt. So that's what we always used to use. Oh, really? Yeah. But uh, regular salt will work. I mean, yeah. it's... Whatever's cheaper, whatever you can get. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and a venting tool. Yes, you're right, Josh. I forgot venting the venting tool. tool. Or a good sharp knife, but you got to hold the tip, not let it go all the way in. I saw this one guy take a venting tool, and he's like stuck it like way up here, like up by the backbone. It's like, oh, my gosh. And he stuck it all the way in. Oh, it's my like, gosh. Oh my, it's like came out the other side of the fish. It's like, <laughs> No, 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 no. That's not how that's supposed to work. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, you just want to go in just maybe a, uh, not even a quarter inch. It's... I mean, I just said it. I said it on the intercom. Will did it during the fishing seminar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, that's frustrating. And there's even a video on uh, the 39-hour page uh, showing them how to vent, uh, how to vent a fish. And there's that same video is on our fishing tips and tricks page, too. i got to uh, say I didn't see a single fish float away that's good. on our trip. That's good. Uh, any tips on a good snapper rod? So the best and greatest snapper rod is right in our, uh, shop. We worked with Bull Bay Tackle, uh, Bull Bay Rods over in Lakeland, a veteran family owned or company, and we developed our own custom line. Now these rods are my favorite setups and kind of the new school versions of, uh, the, more classical <laughs> styles you're, you're of fishing. You're reading my mind. Yes. <laughs> How I get open I, my I mouth. Could he, I could hear your look. <laughs> I could hear your look. So this this would be uh, definitely a great option for snapper, in my opinion. It's a faster action rod. It's got a good backbone to it, but it's a very slow action tip. Uh, so you've got a, a very, very light, sensitive tip, and the rod's overall weight is super light as well. So very, very light. You put a nice reel on it, and uh, you've got something that can handle a grouper, uh, but it can you can feel a pinfish fart in 120 foot of water. It's crazy. It's, it's a good combination. It really is. And it's mm-hmm. a, I, I cannot badmouth it at all. It's, uh, the, the biggest thing with that is you just have to reel first and leave the rod tip down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Leave it down like a 45 degree angle. Let the rod do the work and then slowly lift it up as you're reeling. Mm-hmm. And if you can get that technique, that rod and using braid is extremely efficient. Yeah. For the slower people that can't figure that out, then if you can get one of the slower action rods yeah. and same reel, I mean, you still use the, uh, sh- the, the Saltiga. Reels. Saltiga works great. And uh, put that on uh, a slow action rod, and just that way, if you do jerk it, it, it doesn't. The fish doesn't. You don't pull the bait away from the fish real quick. Yeah. With a rod like you're talking about, it it's so it's so light, and it's so strong in the body. You can just pull that bait right away from them. So you have to be disciplined. Mm-hmm. Crank, don't yank. And uh, the brining of the bait is important, too. The little six-pound cooler with some ice works really well. We do have a little bit of ice on the boat for you to start your brine, but uh, you don't need a lot of ice because the bait's really well frozen. I don't use any ice. Yeah. No, the bait's totally frozen. We put them up there, 
And I mean, you you struggle to cut the baits. Yeah. And that's why you want the bigger shears, the good bait shears. Yeah. And you pop the, you're, you're using a plug for the mangroves, mm -hmm. and uh, that's you, your head and tail in it, and you. Because we don't use the Spanish sardines, we use thread fins. You got to cut the belly out. I like a little bit of ice in the bottom and a little bit of ice at the top. Just and then I pour a cup of salt water in there once I'm done because I like the the liquid going on. Um, because if you don't put ice in there, I find you don't get that dark soupy water yeah. uh, very quickly. Uh, it takes all day for that to develop, and I like that soupy water. I've never done it, but has anyone, you know, I mean, I know people put, like, Manhattan oil in there, and then they get crazy with, like, WD-40 and doing crazy stuff. We used to do that just to goof around. We'd, like, take the the, the, the Spanish sardines we, before we cut the belly out and literally suck the WD-40 tube down in its mouth and, like, fill it up. It was, <laughs> they, they worked, but it was just funny. This, a couple customers used to do that, like, every bait. Really? Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, WD forty, the old formula it was fish oil. Yeah. The, the old new formula. formula isn't fish oil. Yeah. So I don't think it would work now. Yeah. But the old formula was fish oil. Hmm. You never know. Some people <laughs> will try it. It worked. Men it did it all oil. the time. But man had an oil, yeah. Yeah. That's stinky stuff. That's some serious dedication. I, I'd <laughs> skip that step if it was I, me. I don't, I don't need it. I don't, <laughs> you know. Get you some clam juice. Remember that stuff? Oh my god. Gosh, <laughs> we had this uh, uh, this gentleman. It was Will's dad. It was Will's yes. dad. It was a five gallon pail and was sat in yeah. one of our trucks for how many months? Yeah, Will <laughs> started expanding the, the the five gallon pail. It was going to blow up. Will's dad brought this five gallon thing. Thank you, Richard Slusher, for those two hundred stars. Appreciate, it, man. Uh, so Will's dad brought this like five gallon bucket of what was labeled as clam juice to the marina and it sat around in the sun for a while and it was absolutely the most rancid smelling death liquid there ever was i mean you you smelled it from a hundred feet away and you would instantly throw up it was crazy and uh i remember the first time someone tried to dump it out like get rid of it off the dock and uh, uh smoky walked on to the friendly, and they had poured it in the water behind the Florida, and Smokey instantly threw up off the side of the boat. <laughs> and I smelled it coming into the parking lot. I was like, what in the world happened around here? <laughs> and they, they give up trying to pour it out because they didn't they couldn't sit there and physically hold the bucket while it was emptying because it smelled so bad. So then it got closed and got put over in the dumpster area for a while. Then it came back as a joke a couple of times. And uh, it ended up be being thrown into the garbage compactor, <laughs> and then that later that night, I guess Hooters dumped trash, and it the bucket busted in the oh dumpster, my gosh. and a bunch of the Hooters guys were throwing <laughs> up in the garbage area. No one knew what it was. There's this big email sent like, "Who did this? Who threw a dead body in the dumpster?" <laughs> and we played very innocent and I quiet. Didn't have <laughs> Yeah, oh, that no, was no, yeah. like that was three, three weeks no. Ago, like no, no, no. This, this, this that had one. to be ten years ago. No, was it wasn't three. It was probably five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago. There's a bottle of clam juice floating around on the dock right now. Oh, really? There's another one. Yep. Ooh, I gotta go find that. <laughs> That's a hangover cure for sure. Jim yeah. Evans, appreciate those stars, man. <laughs> All right, so let's see what our next... Oh, it is time to give away another free trip. I forgot. 10-hour all day. This one's going to be a 10-hour all day for two guests. Let's see who the lucky winner of a 10-hour all day for two guests is. The Anticipation. John Cassidy. John Cassidy wins a 10-hour all day for two guests. Richard Slusher, thanks, buddy. 500 stars. You're the man. <clears throat> Congrats, John Cassidy. Don't forget to text your full home address to that phone number in the bottom corner there to make sure you claim that free trip and prove you are watching live. Uh, so really important you do that because uh, we don't want anybody to miss out on their free trip. Now, uh, let's see what other question. Oh, we didn't talk about the weather yet. That's a good idea. Let's make sure we get into that. 
So this week, what is the best day to get on the water? What is the best day? Let's find out. Tuesday and Wednesday. I think it's Monday. I I don't know. I'll have to look again. Five and ten hour wind finder forecast, please. Yeah, tomorrow's not gonna be bad. I'm going tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's tomorrow's supposed to be nice, but I I'm think gonna, the I'm best day go was Tuesday. The beach and see if I can find some kingfish. They're out but there. I think man. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday will be two beautiful days. Yeah, looks like Tuesday is gonna be. Can you scroll up a little bit, Josh, so they can see the dates? Yeah, so Tuesday is going to be absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Less than one Peace. foot. Perfect. Breeze. Beautiful day. Yeah, and then Wednesday is still beautiful as and well. starting to clock around. Those are sea directions down there. The wind directions up on the top. It's a kind of a confused wind. I don't know. Scroll up a little bit, Josh. Yeah. Yeah, so it starts clocking around a little bit. Coming out of the south. I guess we got a front coming on Thursday, a light, a mild one. Yeah, it's a really, really weak one. Good. Keep scrolling. So we can get our over midweek or our overnight around. Uh, never Friday. clocked out of the north. Scroll back up a little bit, a little bit more to the next day, a little bit higher. Yeah. So Thursday and Friday, it never clocks out of the north. Huh. It's just a stiff south breeze. Maybe the front misses us and it's just sucking wind Weird. up. All right, I don't know. That's fine. South is good. Yeah, south southeast would well, be real nice. Yeah, it's going to be a part of spring break and stuff. Everyone will be liking that weather. Yeah, and Pinellas County went back. Their spring break is over, so hopefully uh, traffic will have died down at least a little bit. <laughs> nope. Uh, no, we're just going to get used to it. <laughs> yes, that is true. Uh, that's the the downfall of living in paradise. Everybody wants to visit, which is fine. <laughs> Let's see, what other questions do we have? Do you allow jig fishing on the boat as well as bait yeah, fishing? Yeah, the whole time. Yeah, yeah, we definitely uh, allow jig fishing. A lot of people uh, fish with jigs, especially on the longer range trips. You have to be, I mean, you have to be sensitive, the people mm. fishing with jigs, because you're using the floral carp or you're using braid usually, mm-hmm. and you will cut anyone else off. So you have to be very good at what you do yeah. if you're going to fish with jigs. If someone comes on board who's green trying to fish with jigs and they're just make, getting caught up with everyone, it's like, no, nah, you're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you're going to fish uh, with jigs, it's got to be a lighter, lighter load or things have to be perfect. Uh, for you to be able to do it uh, and you have effectively, to be able to cast away and mm-hmm. and be sensitive to the people around you. Yep, yeah, and fishing braid is definitely not something you want to do on your first trip. It's something you want to do once you've really, really gotten yeah. some serious experience under your belt. Yeah, so you don't want to drop a jig right down in between everyone else fishing mono. Yeah, that would not be fair to everyone. Yeah, and we wouldn't let you do it after. You know, we want you to do it a couple times and lose your jig, and cut everyone else off, then it's like, all right. Yeah. So you can fish braid if you fish a top shot, and you can jig, uh, but we really need you to be sensitive to those around you, and then also if it's causing issues, uh, we will have to address that with you. So uh, be careful out there. Uh, Let's see. What other questions do we have here? Never brine my bait. Your thread fins are perfectly frozen. Always catch my limit, plus uh, plenty of other fish. So Thank you. Uh, that's good to, do, to good to hear for yeah. sure. And he we just goes back and gets what he needs each time he you know each yeah. spot. Yeah, that works. That and, works fine. And what you might be talking about too is you might have been doing uh, other shorter trips. So uh, even even on the thirty nine hour, that still works. You definitely don't have to brine your bait, but. Uh, on the shorter trips, you wouldn't bother brining your bait. No. Uh, I would say anything 12 hours or less, I wouldn't really bother brining the bait. Um, but a 12-hour night mangrove snapper trip, I might brine some bait, yeah. but you would want to do that ahead of time. Yeah, because you, I mean, you're, gonna, you're, you're putting that, as soon as you get in a bite of fish, you want to be, the one who's going to catch the most fish is going to be the person who can get that bait where the fish are chewing, the fastest. And spend the most time on the bottom. So you're screwing around up top, messing with getting the bait or fish off and retying your thing, re-getting bait, walking around to where the guy who has bait right there, bam, 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 boom, right back down, boom, 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 back down. 
and he just one after another catches fish. Yeah. And he'll have his limit. Yep. Whereas other people they may have two or three. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That that's the trick is making sure you're fully prepared and ready to rock and roll the whole time. So uh brining bait might be worth it on a twelve hour night trip. But again, you would have to have that kind of prepared ahead of time, which is tricky. Adds another layer of stuff that you have to prepare for. So, I don't know. The advanced angler. Advanced angler. 39 hours, 44 hours. Those are the trips you want to brine your bait for. What's the next question? When is American Red Snapper season starting? So June first. Yes. American Red Snapper season is uh, going to... 1,000 million percent start June 1st for federally permitted for hire boats. FWC controls uh, private recreational angler management for state and federal waters. So whatever the FWC announces, which they will be doing very soon, uh, probably right when they announce the finalized federal season, uh, is FWC does a really great job doing their announcements, and it always causes us a lot of grief uh because we have a bunch of people calling well red snapper's not opening until june 13th fwc says well fwc doesn't manage federally permitted for higher boats so please uh keep that in mind june 1st for federally permitted for higher boats and as far as when it ends we won't know the end date of red snapper until this next golf council meeting in april so uh, hurry up and wait, and we'll also find out at that meeting if Amberjack will open uh, up in May. So definitely excited about this next Gulf Council meeting. A lot of good stuff going to come out of that for sure. Uh, Eric Shahan, appreciate those 500 stars, man. Thank you, Eric. Uh, any record fish ever been caught out of Hubbard's Marina? Holy mackerel. I think there's a couple pages. My gosh, yeah, yeah, we had world records left and right. The the one that I remember the most was a 57 pound gat, rusty belly gag caught on 50 pound test line. Holy moly! On a rental rod. Wow, that's and crazy. And they they didn't they didn't take it to the certified scale. They just <laughs> flayed it. Oh wow! <laughs> that was a state record. Yeah, and that was on a regular all day trip. Captain Sam Carroll fishing uh, bait piles. and Wait, on a 10-hour trip? A 10-hour all-day trip. A 57-pound gag. Yes. And he would he would go out and find on hard bottom. I mentioned it earlier during the show. Just hard bottom and just a big chevron of bait. Well, there's a whole hierarchy of fish under that bait pile. The sharks are eating them. The kingfish are eating them. The fish are underneath, coming up, eating from underneath, and you have you know, the red groupers, your gag groupers down there, and he would anchor on those things and sit there and fish them. And uh, if it's good hard bottom, you're going to pick up heads and tails on the bottom as well as some of those bigger fish. And sure as heck, he, the freaking one of the customers, totally green, caught this giant fish it was flat hard bottom he had nowhere to go he couldn't yeah. get under a ledge so the, the drag was just right everything was just right and he landed it wow but that that but we had a yellowtail snapper i think we had three records it increased every couple of years and then tommy butler beat our record mm -hmm. and um then uh we have had a trumpet fish record we had uh Golly, what is it? Didn't Some Uncle Jeff had uh, the gag grouper record for a while? It was no. 105 pounds, right? Maybe. That Maybe black that. Grouper. And then uh, the uh, Cabrera. Yeah, we would do all. Yeah, we had a, a certified scale. We'd go take the uh, fish to a meat market mm -hmm. because it was a whole deal. You have to get the, the application. It's, it's ridiculous. You have to go down and do all this paperwork, and you have to have it, the fish. Uh, done on a certified scale so it takes a little bit and uh, so a lot of people don't want to deal with that but we have had multiple records state as well as total records um, so that's good yeah they uh, Don's Doc has a certified scale because they sell fish there and uh, they added lionfish to the IGFA oh, uh, cool. site 
And when they did that, we caught the world record lionfish. Then the very next trip, we caught one that broke it. Then the very two trips later, we caught one that broke it again. And I had filled out all the paperwork each time and was, like, getting ready to submit it. And then a trip came in and beat it. So I had three sets of world record lionfish paperwork that I threw in the garbage and said, screw it. <laughs> it is a challenge. Yeah. Because it's just, I mean, they we literally give want. give it to the customer. We give it to the customer. You want to do it, go it. Well, that's what I started doing because the next guy was like, "This Will said this would be the world record. And I was like, I'll print out the paperwork for you, man. <laughs> because, and they don't do it. Yeah, because you have to keep the hook you caught it on, the leader you caught it with. You have to take a picture of the rod. Yeah, the that's reel. right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So to answer your question, yes. We have, I would say probably, if I had to guess, 50 state and Records, whatever I don't know, world yeah. records. I mean, I don't know. It's it's America, so it's American, yeah. United yeah. States records, and state of Florida records. So mm -hmm. I would, if I had to guess, I'd say we probably have fifty over the course of the years had and lost. Yeah, I don't think that we have any on the books currently. <laughs> I don't know. Not that I know of. That red there's a a, a yellow tail skin mount in the friendly fisher and restaurant. That was a record. Yeah. That was one of the record fish. We had it, uh, uh, Uncle Jeffrey had it skin mounted. That's cool. Yeah. And that's a nice fish. Yeah. So I believe Tommy Butler's got the current. No, he, he just lost it. Did he? Some, some uh, real young angler. I think he was like 18 to 20 years old. Uh, uh, his was what, seven and a half pounds? This one was like, I want to say it was almost, it was double digits. It no. was huge. Josh, well, what's Google happening is the, the, yellow the yellow tails snapper. are mating with other species. Yeah. So it's got enough DNA to say it's a DNA to say it's a uh, yeah. yellow tail, but it's actually yellow tail snapper. Yeah. It's it's actually ma they're mating with other species. Yeah. And they're just getting bigger. Yeah. There's there's some big ones. Jeffrey Bowles. Jeffrey Bowles. So what what's the that, oh, is, that doesn't ten, look like ten pounds. That nine does ounces. not look like a yellowtail snapper. Look at that. That is that is one of those fish. It's like it's half mutton and half yellowtail. <laughs> look at it. That is a freaking mutton. Look snapper. at the forehead on that sucker. That it looks like a mutton snapper. That's a mutton snapper scales. Mutton snapper color. Bastard horse. <laughs> ten pounds nine ounces. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so the it was eight pounds nine ounces. Now it's over ten pounds. I knew it was double digits, but that does not have the color of a, a pure. Well, it's, you can't snapper. say the color because he's got the sunset going on. You can't yeah, see the color. Well, the yellow tail snapper is it's it's more silver and it has a yellow stripe right down the middle. Yeah. Now that is more like a mutton snapper. Yeah. Crazy man. All right, let's see here. What's our next question? We are running short on time. Does deep water still open in April? Deep water's open now, yeah. uh, but we just can't keep red grouper or any grouper in uh, anything over 20 fathoms. It's a 20 fathom closure, and that happens in February and March for uh, the spawning uh, protection. Uh, so that ends April 1st, and we're going to go deep for those big tile or big uh, trigger fish and fat red groupers. Yeah. It's going to be exciting for sure. Yeah. That is a file fish. Customers sent in a photo. That is crazy. Yeah. They, they, that is beautiful. It's a very uh, somewhat common inshore but that's file like fish. It's like an albino. No, it's a. Uh, it, I want to. I want to say it's an orange spotted, but I. I looked up the exact name. I've never name. seen that in my life. That's freaking <laughs> awesome looking. I yeah. would have that. I would have that mounted. They they uh, post a photo uh, of that same fish in uh, Tampa Bay Fishing Club probably once a month for wow. a fish ID. That is absolutely beautiful. So that was caught on the Skyway, and they. That's a lot of times uh, where they where they sh show up is those uh, file fish around the rock piles of the Skyway. Pretty cool. I know some uh, some uh, young angler caught a forty pound kingfish off the skyway the other day. So the well, kings skyway are back. Rocks. Yeah, great we tried, place to we fish. Tried to get that RFP. Yeah. Almost had it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when is the next trip that you're running? Mike Upham wants to know. 
you missed good your shot. Question. That's a good question. I would like to run one soon. Uh, it's got to, you know, Captain Brian and Captain Garrett are the two guys. Captain Brian does weekends, and Captain Garrett does a midweek trip. So whatever flavor you want. And then if they can't work, then Joe Drew has the next option to run it. And Joe Drew is a second-generation staff. I mean, his dad worked for us for years. His grandma worked for us. Oh, my gosh. That goes on and on. But um, and Joe after is that, then. then I would love to run. They threatened last year. I tell you what, I might just have to uh, go as a customer there you go. Yeah, you know, this next year, and then uh, you can announce it on Facebook. And yeah, that's what I w- I wanted to go on this past trip with you, but uh, uh, my wife and I had that sonogram appointment for our daughter that yep. I obviously couldn't miss. They won't let me go to uh, the uh, baby appointments because of COVID. Like dudes aren't even allowed in that office. So they let it, they made a special exception. It's like you sleep with a woman all the time. It's like, that's so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> it is uh, exciting, though, with the red snapper season coming up and uh, having a baby, too. <laughs> so the question, answer your question, we don't know. But Dylan will let you know if I'm going to go. And I would actually like to go sometime. Yeah. Uh, maybe in May if they do a, a Amberjack Open. And then uh, definitely during June or July, I wouldn't mind doing a couple trips, even just as a you know, going you better, along as a better, cruise director. Better book now. Yeah. Them, them things are filling up. The well, first... I'll, I'll go up on the roof. I'll, I'll sleep <laughs> on the roof. That's, I love the roof. Yeah. I think we have a captain's guest for you. <laughs> <laughs> we can fit him in somewhere. Yeah. Uh, all right. So do we have time for one more question? Um, are we going on the light load 39-hour trip on Tuesday? Yes. We are 100% going Tuesday. Captain Garrett's running the trip. Only got 21 people on it, super light. And then uh, as far as what my dad said earlier, Garrett does run the midweek overnighters, and then Brian runs the Wednesdays. During Red Snapper season, we have one Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You know, so come this, to think of it, Garrett's with his problem. His foot, yeah. yeah. yeah he'd probably I think still I work. I could run it. I could probably run it. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll announce if that changes. But Garrett is scheduled yeah. for Tuesday's yeah. overnighter. And uh, during Red Snapper season, Captain Joe is going to be running the Sunday trips. So it'll be Joe on Sunday, Brian, or uh, Joe on Sunday, Garrett on Tuesday, and Brian on Friday uh, through Red Snapper season. Uh, so we're excited for sure. Uh, let's see. Then we are out of time for questions, but. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, we'll make sure to get to it after the show. Uh, if you're a supporter, make sure you hop over to the supporters page for the after show. Uh, don't want to miss that. And if you're not a supporter, you can join the supporters group uh, at the top of our uh timeline there there's a button become a supporter and to get access to that private supporters page where we do the after show and uh, you get a little bit more uh, communication and background info trying to do some morning videos with some of the captains and crew when we have time uh, as well so uh, hop over to the supporters page and uh, join us for the after show the rest of you guys will see you next week for another episode of the live stream show it's every sunday night at 8 30 p.m uh eastern so we'll see you next week for another episode and hopefully we'll see you this week for that super light 39 hour tuesday or the light 39 hour friday uh and then we've got tons and tons of five hour half day trips going on and uh tuesday's 10 hour all day looks like a great option uh still catching some mangroves some or uh some hogfish some lane snapper mangrove, seeing the couple kingfish come up. Uh, it is a very busy time of year, though, so all the trips are really filling up fast. Uh, we're sold out for half-day trips one to two days in advance right now. So book early, unless it's a 39-hour. There's plenty of room on the 39-hour. And remember, if you're too busy to go <laughs> fishing. You're just too busy. <laughs> we'll see you on the supporters after show, guys. We'll see the rest of you all next week for another episode of the live show. What's up? 39-hour 39 39-hour giveaway. Oh, my goodness. Son of a sailor. Always forget that one. <laughs> I tricked you guys. I didn't forget. I did forget. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Let's see who won a 39 hour trip for one person. The lucky winner is Paul Davis from Wyamama, Florida. Yeah, we give away these free trips every live show. So make sure you tune in and join us again for more chances to win these free fishing trips. And if you're Paul Davis or one of our other lucky winners, don't forget to text that phone number, your home address, within about five minutes to claim that free trip. And uh, also make sure to read the uh, certificate when we mail it to you. Uh, there are certain times a year where it cannot be redeemed when we're super busy. We're giving away this stuff, and uh, we want you guys to use it. But come use it in slow season when there's nobody around and there's tons of room on the boat. We'll see you guys next week for another episode. We'll see you supporters in a minute. Thanks for watching, y'all.